take any branch of science and its state of art developments as of today and take a look back and ask ourselves a question how did it all started or how did it got evolved to the state where we are it is quite rare to get these artifacts which explain the history of science and the bakshali manuscript is an 1800 years old artifact which explains about the history of mathematics and this manuscript is one of the world's oldest mathematical artifact that is still alive today and this story is all about the bakshali manuscript let's get started so let's break this doc film into three parts the first one is the history and the background of the bakshali manuscript what is its antiquity all about and stuff like that and in the second part we'll try to understand the script and the writing style of this manuscript which indeed speaks quite a lot about its antiquity and third and the last part is the main thing the contents of this manuscript what is in it and especially why is that this manuscript holds the most important details with respect to mathematics which is not available in any other manuscript in first hand around the world so all in all let's try to understand the complete picture about the bakshali manuscript so that's the first one the history and the background of the bakshali manuscript in the year 1881 in a village called bakshali in the northwestern part of india which is current day pakistan a farmer was digging out in an ancient building an abandoned one and that's when he unearthed this manuscript which is written on birch bark birch bark is a thin layer of a bark of a tree which was used for writing before the invention of paper and this farmer handed over the manuscript to the british authorities back then This manuscript was given by the British to Dr. Rudolf Horn, a German Indologist and Philologist, to examine and assess the antiquity and the contents of this manuscript. After a 5 to 6 year period of study, he published in 1887 a book called The Bakshali Manuscript in Vienna, Austria. And this book is going to be our major source of information to understand the Bakshali Manuscript. And also what I just said a minute ago about how this manuscript was discovered by a farmer in Bakshali was also written by Dr. Rudolf in this very book. One very important aspect here is a German Dr. Rudolf researching about an Indian manuscript under the rule of the British and got published 200 years ago this very book. So we can safely assume that this book is beyond any biases and it has just pure facts about this manuscript. Before getting to the manuscript, first let's understand something about Bakshali, this small village in modern day Pakistan. Within 50 to 100 kilometers radius from Bakshali, there are two very important ancient cities. One is Pushkalavati and the other one is Takshasila, which is shortly called as Taxila. And we've got to understand a little bit about these two very ancient cities to get a hang of what Bakshali was probably back then. These two very ancient cities, Takshasila and Pushkalavati, has a very deep historical background dating all the way back to the times of Sri Ramayana. Towards the end of Sri Ramayana in the Uttarakhanda written by Sri Valmiki Maharshi, Bhagavan Sri Ram coronates the sons of his and his brothers as the kings for different parts of his kingdom. Right at that point, the maternal uncle of Bharata, who is from the Gandhar Desha, that's the modern day Afghanistan, their kingdom in that region faces threat from the Gandharan tribes. And the maternal uncle of Bharata seeks help from Bhagavan Sri Ram back then. And this is how Sri Rama responds. Just look at the highlighted parts in red. Bharata syatma jau veerau takshaka pushkala yevaja. Which means the sons of Bharata who are takshaka and pushkala. Who are of great valor and courage. Nihatya gandhar vasutan dvepure vibajishyataha. Will come and defend your country against the gandharan tribes. And divide the geography into two parts. And establish two cities. And that is how the The city established by Takshaka became Takshasila and the city established by Pushkala became Pushkalavati. And these two cities which were established almost at the time of the end of Sri Ramayana played an incredibly important role for many thousands of years and are of great value of archaeological importance even today. We all know that the Takshasila University is the oldest university in the world, dating all the way back to around 600 BCE. And people from both East and the West used to study in this Takshasila University. And that speaks a lot about the archaeological importance of Takshasila as we know today. In around the same time of 700 to 600 BCE, Pushkalavati flourished as part of the Achaemenid Empire, which is the old Persian Empire. 
which is modern day Iran. So the main point for us here is Bhakshali is geographically located very close to these very important ancient cities and especially Takshasila, which was a university of great knowledge in ancient times. And that sets a very clear and good backdrop in which the Bhakshali manuscript would have been authored back then. And from the times of Sri Ramayana, which is many thousands of years back in history, if we move forward a little bit to around 250 to 100 BCE, the times of Mauryan Empire and when the Indo-Greek confluence established with the Bactrian Kingdom. Then as well, we see that Bhakshali is right at the confluence of the Indo-Greek and Roman cultures in the northwestern part of India. And this is reinforced by Dr. Rudolph's observations about this manuscript. So here is what Dr. Rudolph says. As part of this manuscript, there are mathematical calculations which talk about profit, loss, and interest. And in those articulations, he observed that the two words Dinara and Dhamma occur as denominations for money. And these words are the Indian forms of the Latin denarius, which is the currency of ancient Rome, and the Greek drachma. So mention of these currencies which are from ancient Rome and from ancient Greece clearly establishes that there was a confluence of Greco-Roman and Indian relations in trade and political spheres. And Bhakshali is almost at the center of this confluence. And with that very quick outlook about Bhakshali, coming back to the Bhakshali manuscript. Today, the Bhakshali manuscript is in the Bodleian Library of the Oxford University, UK. It was moved from India to UK almost more than 100 years ago. And there is quite a lot of research that has been done on all these years on this manuscript. A couple of years ago, the University of Oxford released a video about the Bhakshali manuscript. I'll try to leave the link in the description below should you be interested to watch it. It is in an extremely fragile state and a very recent carbon dating that was done by the Oxford University. It establishes that it's almost 1800 years old document which dates back all the way to 200 to 250 AD period. So that's pretty much about the background and history of the Bhakshali manuscript. Now let's get to its script and writing style. So here is what Dr. Rudolph says about the script of this document. It is written in Sharada script. Sharada script is a very ancient format of writing Sanskritam, named after Saraswati Devi. And this Sharada script is almost extinct today for its use in Sanskritam as we have adopted the Devanagari script. But this very Sharada script of writing Sanskritam is the ancestor for Gurmukhi, which is widely used across Punjab as the official script for writing Punjabi. But having said that Sharada script is almost extinct today, but Sharada script was very popular among the Kashmiri Pandits. And apparently the Sharada script is still in usage in the Kashmiri Pandits communities for religious purposes. This Sharada script was very popular in the Kashmir region, which is revered as the highest seat of knowledge across Bharat. And today this Sharada Peet, which is the highest seat of knowledge and the birthplace of this Sharada script of Samskritam, lies in the ruins of the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir region. As we see that the Bhakshali manuscript is written in Sharada, are there any other evidences about the Sharada script being well used during the same time, there is one very important artifact on that lines. Siddha Matrika is another variant of writing Samskritam, which is kind of contemporary and successor of Sharada script, and it spread westwards into the Afghanistan region. Just take a look at this Ganesh statue. Pretty different with a flat crown on the head and muscular legs and muscular shoulders. This statue of Ganesh was a confluence of Greek and Indian cultures together. More than 1500 years ago, this Mahavinayaka was consecrated in the Kabul region of Afghanistan. And if you see the pedestal on which Ganesh is standing, there is an inscription. This inscription is in Siddha Matrika, a close variant to Sharada script in which the Bakshali manuscript is also written. And apparently this is what is inscribed on this pedestal. This is how it reads. This great and beautiful Mahavinayaka was consecrated by the renowned Shahi king, the illustrious Sri Kingla. So a king named Sri Kingla has consecrated this Mahavinayaka almost 1500 years ago, which was carved in an Indo-Greek style. So like this, if we start tracing the history of the Sharada script, it takes local variants and spread right from Afghanistan up until China over many centuries. So if we take the big picture, 
we have Brahmi, which is the most ancient format of writing Sanskritam. And from Brahmi, we have Sharada, in which the Bakshali manuscript is written. And from Sharada, we have Siddhamatrika. And from Siddhamatrika, we have the Devanagari script, which we are currently using for writing Sanskritam. With an exception of Devanagari, if we see rest all names of the writing systems, Brahmi, Sharada, Siddhamatrika, all the writing systems are given under the name of Saraswati Devi. So that's a detailed view about Sharada script, what it is and how it got evolved. Now let's get back to the Bhakshali manuscript. Now that we understood the script of it, let's try and understand the writing style. So as quoted by Dr. Rudolph in his book about the writing style of Bhakshali manuscript, he clearly mentions that it is written in a sutra format. So now what is a sutra format? Here it is. Swalpaksharam asangdigdam saravad vishvato mukham astobham anavadyam cha sutram sutra vido viduhu. A sutra format of writing Sanskritam is all about articulating the largest of the message in shortest of its forms. And these are the seven properties of a sutra format of writing Sanskritam. The first one is Swalpaksharam, use of minimum number of letters in the articulation of a sentence. Asangdigdam, it should be unambiguous. Saravad, concise. Vishwatomukam, universal. And then Astobham, non-redundant. Anavadyamcha, without a flaw. So these are the properties that needs to be complied when a sutra format of writing Sanskritam is articulated. Now, I made a detailed documentary on the sutra style of writing Sanskritam and I'll leave the link in the description should you wish to watch it. This sutra format of articulating Sanskritam is very ancient practice. It dates back all the way to Panini's Ashtadhyay which is many thousands of years old and used by many rishis in articulating different varieties of sutras. And the best part with sutra is it is very short form of a piece of knowledge that you can easily carry in your head and use it accordingly. And the Bhakshali manuscript is written in this writing writing style of sutras. So that is about the script and the writing style in brief. Now let's get to the contents of the Bhakshali manuscript. So finally the cat is out of the bag. Here are the contents of the Bhakshali manuscript. It is a collection of different mathematical concepts ranging from arithmetics, algebra, geometry, fractions and square roots, progressions, profit laws and interest calculations, dealing with quadratic equations, indeterminate equations and many more. So it is a compendium of all these mathematical concepts explaining different rules, procedures, how to solve them and most importantly all these applications are in real life scenarios. We'll see that in a minute. But the research paper which was published by GRK back in 1927, after Dr. Rudolf passed away, K picked up the analysis of Bakshali manuscript and these are his findings about the same manuscript. So as you can pause and read the excerpts of this white paper that I highlighted in red and towards the bottom part of it, this is what Mr. K says. The indeterminate equations of the first degree and the so-called Pellian equation, both of which enter largely into the later Hindu works. It is not present in Bakshali manuscript, but what he says is eventually in the other Hindu scriptures, dealing with indeterminate equations of the first degree was pretty well detailed out. And what's more important is the solution of which the Hindus long anticipated the works of Euler and Lagrange. So what it means is, what Mr. K is saying is that the Hindus had the solution for solving these indeterminate equations long before Euler and Lagrange. This is very important. It was Brahmagupta in the 600s who worked extensively on these indeterminate equations. Well, that's a kind of a mathematical concept, so we'll stay away from it for now. Let's stick back to Bhakshali manuscript. So this is the most impressive and interesting part of the manuscript, the construct in which the mathematical concepts are articulated. So for all the subsects that we just saw right from arithmetics, mensuration, geometry and a lot more, the problems or rather the procedures are given in this structure. It is a five step procedure always. It starts with the first one, the rule, the rule related to a specific mathematical concept which is called as Sutram. So Sutram is the first step which establishes a rule for a mathematical concept and then comes Tada which is an example of that rule rather an elaboration in words and then comes the third one Sthapanam which is the example in numbers. So transposing that theoretical example which is in Tada into more a numerical example in Sthapanam. And the fourth part is Karanam which is the actual solution for that mathematical problem. And finally Pratyayam is the proof of the rule that was given all the way above. So basically Pratyayam reinforces that the Sutram which is the topmost part is true. Just take a look at these five steps. 
it establishes a rock solid understanding about a mathematical concept for any student who goes through all these five steps. I've also pasted the excerpt about this structure from the book of Dr. Rodolph on Bhakshali manuscript. You can pause and read if you want. So this is the complete construct of one mathematical concept in all five stages, a word to word articulation from Sanskritam to English as given by Dr. Rodolph in his book. If we see the first thing it starts with is Sutram, which is the rule about a given mathematical concept. What it is, we'll get to that a little later. And then comes Tada, which is an example of how that rule could help us in words. And then comes Thapanam, a numerical elaboration of the same example. And then Karanam, the actual solution, the mathematical operations here just try and observe one thing the way the numbers are added the karanam piece of the manuscript i tried to paste towards the left you see the boxes and the numbers the way they are written it is a very different way of dealing with numbers from the way what we are dealing today if you are interested do your own research about the scripture as to how the mathematical operations are articulated in this manuscript and it is quite interesting and different as well and finally comes the fifth step at the bottom part which is pratyayam which is a proof which reinforces the sutram which was articulated all the way at the starting of this elaboration. This closed loop learning concept is very powerful even by today's standards and I'm sure for the next centuries to come it will remain to be a very powerful technique if employed because it addresses all aspects of the learning right from starting the concept, understanding it, elaborating it in words and then numericals and then solution and then proof and connecting way all the back from Pratyayam to Sutram. I think that is just incredible. The way they thought through 1800 years ago, how to teach mathematics. I just have no words to articulate their intellect. And here are a few problems from the manuscript. They are more than kind of a real life examples. The first one, if you see a carriage, when yoked with 10 horses, travels 100 yojanas in a given amount of time. If same carriage is yoked with five horses, when will the carriage arrive at the destination? It's all about the speed, distance, time calculations and concepts. And do remember that the speed, distance, time equations, what we know as per modern historical accounts, comes in only from Galileo Galilei in the 1600s. But the speed, distance, time calculations were known in Bharat since many hundreds of years even before that. In Bhakshali manuscript stands yet another evidence for it. And on a lighter note, Aryabhatta in Aryabhatiya gave the speed, distance, time calculations 1100 years before Galileo Galilee. But we don't know about the scientific contributions that came in from Bharat. Well, that is the sorry state of affairs that we are having today. Anyways, getting back to the topic. So the second problem as an example that I quote here is there are three merchants. First merchant has seven horses. Second merchant has nine ponies. And the third one has 10 camels. Each of them gives away three animals to be equally distributed among themselves. So finally, the question is, what is the value of each animal? and what is the worth of each merchant's initial property. So these are the kinds of problems or examples that were quoted in Bhakshali manuscript which are very closely connected to the real life scenarios for commerce and trade and other aspects. So moving forward, what is mathematics if we don't talk about numbers? And this is one of the prime reason Bakshali manuscript is very special because it is the world's oldest written record about the place value system and the concept of zero in its own right as an independent number with a detailed elaboration of the positional notation system, which is also called as the Hindu number system that we are using across the world today. And the numbers that are written, the numerals, you see the script, how it is the one two three four five six seven eight nine zero that's how they are written across the bakshali manuscript and specially zero is represented with a dot as shown here from the manuscript snippet and five years ago, back in 2017, Oxford University released a press statement about the Bhakshali manuscript on the revised carbon dating, where it placed it in 200 AD, which is almost 1800 years ago from now. And in the same statement, the detail about this existence of zero, which is the oldest written record of zero as we know today, properly employed into a positional notation system, which is usable for mathematics. They also quoted a lot more details about the Bhakshali manuscript. You can read the press release for yourself. So that's all in all, a brief outlook about the Bhakshali manuscript and various aspects of it. The most interesting and impressive part of this manuscript is the construct, the five-step approach, right from Sutram up until the proof, Pratyayam. I think these kind of learning methodologies should be brought back because it will definitely help the students to learn mathematics in a more efficient manner. Just try to think about this. Somebody has invented this construct 1800 years ago, and which is very valid even today. 
So we should be building on top of this. So what is that we could think of in shaping up mathematics, which will be valid for next 1800 years or even more than that. So Bhakshali manuscript stands as a very strong inspiration on that note. And as always, thanks for watching.